Happy Thursday right here in Mass Listeners. Joining us today is Heather O'Connor, the founder of O'Connor Family Law, a law firm based on the principle that with the correct guidance, a person can come out of divorce or family law related dispute in a better position than coming in, both legally and personally. After difficult divorce, Heather knew that the way divorce was done had to change. With, moving, with nothing more than a high school diploma, she went to community college and law school to create a new life for herself and for her young kids. Now running her own law firm, Heather is living out her dream of giving people a new path forward in life each and every day. Heather, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Do you want to share more about yourself with our audience? Sure. So um, I guess just where I came from, because I think for two reasons, one, it tells a little bit more about really what the vision is of our firm and what we're built on as well as I really hope it gives um, some inspiration to people who might be going through a really hard time or feeling as though, you know, their life is completely being uprooted and they don't know what they're going to do forward. And that, that question that you're often left with is what am I going to do with my future? You know, Mm -hmm. am I going to be able to create anything, especially because I did go through a divorce when I was still young, but still a little bit older. So, um, and I, I'll try to keep it down because I'm sure it's something I could talk about forever in and of itself. <laughs> but so, yeah, I went through my own divorce when my kids were all under the age of six and I've got three kids. So my marriage had, it was very unhealthy just to, to keep it nice and easy. Through my divorce process, there were so many things that I saw wrong. And one of the big things was my first attorney, he, he had this outlook where I would call for things and he talked the right lingo. Like he talked about, so legal custody and physical custody and what all those things meant, but there was a disconnect on the emotional side where oftentimes I'd walk into court and you get hit with this slew of emotions when you're going through a process like that, where on one side, especially where I was coming out of an unhealthy marriage, I was excited to be leaving. You know, it was moving forward into a place where I was really hopeful there would be peace. With that, it was terrifying because I didn't know what to expect. And sometimes it's so much easier to stay in a bad spot than to move out of that comfortability into something that you don't know, whether that could be much better or it could be worse. And that's scary. There would be, you know, where I'd be excited because now my kids were and I were going to be able to spend more, more quality time together. Um, but then I'd be crying, you know, within mm-hmm. two seconds of laughing back, sitting in the back of my closet going like, what am I doing? Everything I know is gone. The disappointment in the expectation of a marriage that was ending. So there was all these emotional roller coasters that I went through that that was never touched upon. And I did a lot of work on myself coming out of my divorce. And I honestly believe that to get the best result, you have to start to change you because you Mm. can't control the other person. You know, as much as I like to say that we can control the outcome, we can't, you know, you can't control the judge. You can't control your spouse. You can't control the opposing counsel. And it's a matter of really changing you, changing your perceptions, your reactions, your habits, to help you move forward in life. And that's what I saw missing terribly within the process. And I thought, hey, I think I can do this way better than what I see. So I did, I started back to school um, with nothing. You know, I had had a high school, de- high school degree. And so with three young kids, I had people say, you have no idea what you're doing. Like, this is impossible. And at times it definitely felt that way. I felt as though maybe I had taken on a bigger bite than I could chew. I felt, am I being selfish? Because, you know, I'm putting my kids, they had to go to daycare before that I had been a stay-at-home mom, you know? So there were all these things that I felt I was making other people give up where then you get the mom guilt, you know, you get the, am I going after something for me that means I'm not helping the people that I'm supposed to be there for. So there were all these things. And long story short, you know, I was able to come out of that situation. We opened O'Connor Family Law in 2016. 
we've expanded. We've got 10 attorneys right now. We have another five that we're in the process of hiring. Um, So we have been able to really, really expand. And I think a lot of that has to do with the philosophy that we take of you're not just getting a legal result. We want you to change your life. And that that's our vision. That's our mission. And everything we do really has that focus. Which is so important and exactly, and it relates back to what I had shared in your bio is that helping people to become better, being in a better position, both personally and legally. And that part is key to both the personally component of that. And so with that, could you talk more about how you differentiate yourself in that aspect? In addition to, of course, the legal components, how do you make your clients feel validated, secure, and supported throughout, of, of course, a very vulnerable time in their life? So I think one is setting expectations, you know, having the discussions right out the right out the gate of what's realistic and what's not. And I've heard other attorneys, I heard it when I went through it, where they'll tell you, oh, you're you definitely get this, you'll definitely get this. There's no way to know that. So being mm-hmm. able to work with somebody where you're building that trust, because there are going to be times that you have to give bad news or you have to tell them the judge isn't coming back in your favor. And having that relationship where they know that you're not just making a backdoor agreement. You know, you're not, it's not just a handshake deal of I'll scratch your back and you scratch mine. It, it's really, we're fighting, you know, we're fighting for you to be heard. And that trust, I think that's built from the very beginning is so vitally important. And I think does set us apart. On top of that, we have brought in a divorce coach that we have on staff to really start working with people right from the get-go of even if it's just one simple issue, we we do a lot of high conflict parenting um, cases. And a lot of times they have no idea how to speak to it, the other party, how to get their voice heard so that, you know, they're not destroying their own case a lot of times. Um, so the high conflict relationship coach can really start working with them on co-parenting and communication. And even if it's just one little area Um, it can make a huge difference. And it also helps keep down legal costs because then they're not relying on their attorney as that emotional, you know, person and that emotional support going through the divorce. And the attorney can really focus on the legal issues, which is what you're paying significant funds for, um, without it being a mix. So we're finding that it does help keep costs down as well. So I'd say, you know, I don't know if I can swear on your podcast, but we give a shit, you know, that (laughs) that's, that's what I go for. And whenever we're bringing people into onboard, it's always, a the goal is to make every single person feel as though their case is the only one that you have. And of course, Mm. you know, we, we carry a full caseload, so there's juggling there, but we never want anyone to feel like a number or feel as though they're not just as important. Yes, and definitely not having some type of transactional relationship, but exactly like you said, really bringing in that personal component into it. Yeah. And so one of the things that I think is so inspiring about you is the fact that your own story really helped you to create an amazing law firm that, as you mentioned, has five new attorneys coming in and just seeing all this growth since, was it 2016 you said you started it? 2016. Yeah, so seven years, which is amazing. So I'd love to hear what it was like between going through a divorce and then realizing you wanted to go back to school to become an attorney and how that juggling happened between having three kids under the age of six and being able to balance your school and just how you did it all. One day at a time. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it definitely, there was that long-term vision of, I knew what I wanted to do and that would help push me through. But I remember one day, so I lived in Fall River while I was going through, um, school because it was cheap and my kids were going to school there and my daughter was in um she was in the public school and middle school and the grade that she was in they said everybody needs to take portuguese and she said i don't want to take portuguese i want to take mandarin because i want to have a career and that's the you know top language right now to know to keep my options open and they said no you live in fall river you need to learn Portuguese because people who are from here don't leave. And she stood up in her class and she was telling me about this later because she was really upset about it. And she looked at the teacher and she said, 
look, you don't tell me or anyone else in this class that you are stuck somewhere because of where you come from. I watched my mom and she had nothing and now she's in law school and she's going to be a lawyer so she can do it. Anybody can do it. And it was that story stayed with me through every single time I continued to doubt myself because I was no longer doing it just for me. I was doing it to set an example for my daughter. And that, that was really, um, in relation to my story, I mean, there, I went through so many crappy things in my life and the way I've been able to rationalize it. And I do believe everything happens for a reason. There might be things that I can't understand why they're happening to me. I don't, you know, I remember certain things where I'd sit there and I'd say, what did I do so wrong to deserve this? And I had to take a step back and say, maybe it's not for me. Maybe it's so at some point in my future, I can sit across from somebody who feels as though they're the only person who is walking in these shoes. And I can honestly empathize with them and understand where they're coming from. And so with my daughter telling me the story, that was the first time I realized how much everything I was going through and every struggle that I had was influencing somebody else and inspiring them to be able to, to be more than what other people might be telling them they could be. And I've just found every single time in life, I go through something really, really difficult. It almost becomes a responsibility where you have to get through it. I have to push through this. I have to figure out a way to make it into a positive because someday I'm going to help somebody else because I've gone through this. And I think that is really, you know, when you ask me, how did you get through everything that, you know, it was knowing that someday everything I was doing could really help somebody else achieve more in their life than other people let them believe that they could. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, that that's what got me going in the morning. (laughs) Yeah. It's such a powerful story. I mean, to know that you're setting that example and knowing exactly like your daughter said, if she can do it, anyone else can do it. And I think that's so important to remember is that although things can seem really difficult right now, you're setting an example to other people and you might not even realize that. And I think that's really amazing. Yeah. And I think one of, um, it was one of the first trials I had and I was representing the husband, the opposing counsel was representing the wife who was a young mom. You know, she, she had a lot of life left in her. And the attorney came to me and she was making this whole argument that, you know, mom's been a stay at home mom. She has no skills. She can't do anything. You know, she, she needs all the child support and all the alimony because she's got nothing. And I looked at her, I go, uh, you are preaching to the wrong choir. (laughs) (laughs) There is nothing that can stop her from doing if that's what she wants to do. And, um, again, that, That's been my experience and what I really hope we can influence people who are going through such a hard time that just because of where you are now is not where you can be. Absolutely. And with your career, did you work for another law firm previously before starting O'Connor Family Law? I'd love to hear more about what that transition was like of going, jumping into entrepreneurship. Sure. So I've always been a little bit of an entrepreneur at heart. Even when I was a kid, I used to pretend that I knew karate so I could charge my friends a dollar to teach them karate. (laughs) So I, I always looked for ways to make money. But when I decided to become an attorney, you know, in all honesty, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, which I think being naive allowed me to do it, where if I looked back now, I'd be like, oh, crap. (laughs) But, But, um, I had this notion that every attorney was really rich, you know, and if I put in the hard work, I'd eventually make it. And that was better than, you know, bartending seven nights a week to try to scrape by. So I entered it with that thought process. And um, so my goal from day one was I need to get in and out of school as quickly as possible so that I can open my own law firm and, you know, start everything that I'm dreaming of. But then, you know, things happen along the way. And in my, my 3L year of law school, I got the opportunity to um, apply for a clerkship, which is a very prestigious position once you come out of law school. So I ended up clerking for the chief justice of the Rhode Island Supreme Court for two years. 
And then at the end of that, I'm opening a law firm. I'm opening a law firm. This is what I'm going to do. And then again, kind of naive, I didn't know how LinkedIn worked, but I kept getting this this message that this law, this family firm wants you to apply. And I thought, wow, they're really after me. Like, I didn't know it was just that automatic. Like, it just goes out to you constantly. Um, but I applied for them because then I was like, well, you know, some experience probably wouldn't be a bad thing. So during that interview process, and I had seen this even when I applied for my school's law review, um, there was a pushback to the fact that people knew I had children because there's always this question of, are you biting off too, more than you can chew? Are you able to do it all? Are you able to do as much as somebody that doesn't have kids? And that came up in my law review, um, my law review interview. It, it definitely, I think, played into when I was interviewing with this, with this firm. Now, the owner of the firm really, really liked me and I knew he wanted to hire me. The managing partner, not so much. You know, he he was not pro Heather. And I had to go through a number of different interviews to get onto this firm where at one point I was like, why am I doing this? I'll just start my own practice. And it was my very last interview. And the managing attorney asked me the question of where else have you applied? And I looked at him, I go, well, nowhere. This, this is the only place I've applied. And he looked across the table and kind of leaned back and, you know, crossed his arms, like, I got you. And he's like, so all your eggs are in this basket. Wow. And I leaned back in and I said, oh no, all my eggs are in my own basket. This was my backup plan. And oh so gosh. even, so at that point, the owner was like, she's hired. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I really enjoyed the firm that I worked at. I learned a lot. The owner was very um, business focused as well as making sure that the, you know, the attorneys were doing their job. But there was a business focus that usually isn't introduced within a lot of, or at least what I saw a lot of law firms of growing. Mm. Um, through, during my clerkship, I believe I had gotten into an L MLM company called Beachbody. And so I had done that, had risen, you know, to the top of that company, learned so much about sales and just building relationships. And that's really all that sales are throughout my entire you know, going back to school and everything, I was very open with my story. I was very open with what my goals were, what my struggles were. And so I had built up kind of this social media following before it even became like a cool thing to do. But so once I joined the firm, I already had a ton of people who were like, I can't wait for you to be an attorney. I want you to represent me. And oh, at I the firm, that. I was getting a lot of my own clients rather than the firm giving them to me. And it just got to the point where I said, okay, I, I think I'm ready to do this. And that's what happened in 2016. Now it was scary as hell because yeah. you go from having the security of a paycheck to, okay, now I eat what I kill. Like that's, that's scary. Um, but it, it, it could, I could not have had a better decision. You know, it was yeah. great timing and it was a great experience for me. Absolutely. And that's what I was just going to ask you is what that pivotal moment was that made you realize, like, even though you always knew you wanted to own your own firm, that pivotal moment that made you realize when it was finally time. And I think it's great that it's the fact that you were bringing in the business. And so mm -hmm. if you probably had this moment where you thought to yourself, why am I bringing someone else so much money when I can bring myself this money and make <laughs> even more from it? Yep. I mean, it's definitely a cost benefit analysis, but I think also at the time, the, the firm I was at was going through a lot of changes and everything just kind of aligned all at the same time where there was a lot of changes going on. I felt as though the clients that I were bringing in, it wasn't as though I was just starting fresh. So it was really a combination of everything. Um, but you know, worked out really well. <laughs> Absolutely. And with O'Connor family law, did you start off with just yourself or did you immediately bring in like a paralegal or someone else like that who could support you? So the paralegal I had at the firm, again, I was very open with the fact that I was going to have my own place at some point. And um, she believed in me so much. And she would constantly say, if you ever do it, you know, make sure you take me with you because I want to work with you. And so when I first opened again, you know, I'm terrified. I just need to be able to make enough money for me and to be able to feed my kids. So I was very hesitant to bring anyone with me. And I ended up um, 
just because I was really busy right off the bat, I found it to be extremely overwhelming trying to do the legal work as well as like the billing and the, you know, everything, all the administrative parts that go into owning a business. So I brought in an office manager and the paralegal called me and she's like, so you didn't want me? And I'm like, no, it's not that I didn't want you. Like I just, this was the need I had and it's not, I don't know if I can pay you. And yeah. so she was great. And she came back and said, you know, if you need additional support, I can w- try to work part time. I can work after hours. You know, we can do it on an hourly basis. So you don't have to take on a salary. And I was working with a coaching company at this point, And it was the subject matter of one of my calls where I said, you know, I don't know what to do because I'm terrified to take on another salary. What if I can't pay her? And they, they said, well, what happens if you do it and it works out. And I was like, well, that would be fantastic. And they were like, we'll make it happen. And I was like, good point. So like (laughs) I texted her right away and I was like, F it, give your notice. You're coming on board. (laughs) And so she did. And, you know, we had those two people and we've just slowly, you know, grown. We've had hires that didn't work out and you learn from every single thing. But, um, you know, right now we have a really fantastic team. I'm very biased because, you know, I am, but um, (laughs) I think we have an amazing team. We all are right on the same page with, you know, culture and, and I don't want to say our personalities are all the same because we're not, but all our personalities really work together to bring a lot of diversity in where you can look at an issue and see it in 10 different angles. So I think it's really beneficial for our clients as well. Definitely. And I always say that's like probably the most difficult part of entrepreneurship is that going through that first hire, because I remember I was in that same exact spot where I'm like, can I pay this person and just worrying, but it's like, when you haven't done it yet, it's hard to understand the idea of in order to make more money, you have to spend money. And then once you get comfortable with it, then you're like, who can I hire next? What, what else can I delegate out to someone else and get off my plate? But you're so right. Just that initial first step is really, really hard. And I think another really hard thing is most people, I believe, who are entrepreneurs have that A-type personality. And, you know, I won't speak for all of them, but at least myself, I tend to be a little controlling and a little like, (laughs) I know I can do a really good job. So, you know, I'll just do it. And then you guys can just take it over and go from there. That was very hard giving up to be able to delegate something and say, okay, you have the authority to do this, especially when it's something as important as our clients, you know, and making sure that, that I know the level of service that I give, I know the, you know, how I present a case and how I want that. And being able to take a step back where that's not the role I'm in anymore. You know, I really run the firm as the CEO at this point. And that I think was probably even harder than that first hire, because it's, it's putting your trust in other people, you know, saying that you can do it is one thing doing it is another ball game. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And going back to what you mentioned earlier about hiring five new attorneys, it's not just one, it's five. How did you know that you needed that many hands on deck? And what's, what has it been like to go through huge growth like that? Not really just kind of incremental growth, but really go from point A to point E ultimately with that. Yeah. So, um, we, we've had rapid growth, you know, every single year in and out, um, right now in, in, all honesty, like we have a wait list. We, we can't take in new cases because we don't have anywhere to put them without either overloading the staff that we already have or potentially reducing somebody's quality of care, which mm. are two things we don't want. And of course it sucks to have a wait list because there's all potential, you know, clients that you're not able to service. So five of those, we're looking for two people who really have experience, who can come in the door um, that we can trust or, you know, with, with minimal training are going to be able to take over that role. But what we're also at the point of, and um, what we've seen while growing is that a lot of times when somebody needs to hire, especially for family law, they want to hire somebody with experience, but there are so many people coming out of law school, you know, myself included when I was there that really have a passion for family law, but they don't have the experience and they just need the chance. So three, um, potentially four, we're, we're trying to decide whether it's going to be three or four. 
we're, we're starting a junior associate program, which is really going to be focused on building that foundation and almost like an additional year of school where we're putting them through a, a very intense training period to get them where they're really able to take on the associate role, but without potentially harming somebody's case because they don't know what they're doing. So yeah. that's, you know, it's one of those things we had to grow to be able to get to that point because, you know, as a business, everything comes down to bottom line profitability and return on investment. So when you take on, you know, three to four employees that, you know, for a period of time are not going to make you any return, that is a huge investment and huge cost. Mm -hmm. Luckily, we're at that point where we can do it. And I think it's just going to be a huge benefit, not only to the legal community, as well as, you know, the, the attorneys who just need that chance and that ability to, to learn as well as to our clients, because the junior associates, once they are able to start taking on cases, are going to be able to do it at a reduced cost, you know, until they build up the experience to move forward. So that's where we are. That's where we're growing. I think, you know, every, every growth spurt comes with new challenges. Uh, you know, you, you can't where, where right now, you know, I think um, we're looking at being by the end of the year, close to like a $4 million run rate. That's a very different company than a $500,000 firm. It's nowhere close to where I want to go. So there's a lot of change that needs to happen because you can't stay in the same mindset. And I know this for me, I know this for my executive team. It's a matter of constantly growing and moving into where you want to move your business into. And Absolutely. that's really what we focus on. We know that when we're, you know, another 10 million down the road, it, that's a completely different ballgame from where we are now. It, but that's why you constantly move forward and grow with it. Right. And I love the idea of having a junior associate program that you're starting because it's like the whole concept of the chicken before the egg. Like someone can't get a job because they don't have experience, but they can't get experience because they don't have a job. And so yeah. it's like this really difficult position to be in. And I think it's great that you're starting that to help support recent graduates from law school to help get them started. But I also imagine that with them coming under your wing, you're able to kind of train them exactly how you like going back to that type A personality. You know that they're going to do it exactly how you want to and they won't have that other experience that might kind of influence how they do things or what their processes might be exactly you know with the the vision of my firm i want to be the largest and the best family law firm in massachusetts with that means i want to train the attorneys whether they stay with us hopefully you know we have a culture that everybody will want to stay with and retire from is that realistic probably not but the goal would be to train attorneys um, that really get out, whether, again, they're with us or somebody else or they start their own place, that have that quality background where we know that if they're on the other side, it's going to be a good challenge. You know, they're, it's going to be a fair fight. You know, it's not going to be a dirty fight, but they know what they're doing, you know, and they're ethical and they, they abide by the rules, but they know how to argue zealously for a client. So yeah. that's what we're kind of doing is I, I want to take over the family law community and have a real strong influence on not only the attorneys, but then as the attorneys become judges so that yeah. every judge that takes the bench has that background. Absolutely. And speaking of community and growing the firm, you also have two locations in Massachusetts. I think it's Westboro and Hingham. Is Hanover. that right? Hanover. Yep. Hanover. Um, so with that, how did you choose a, those locations? Did you find that your clients were kind of from those areas or like, what was that process like of determining where you'd like that, that to set up shop ultimately? Um, that was all very um, personal, like, and I'm trying to think of the good word, but basically it worked for me. <laughs> so, so Westboro was more so I lived in Grafton at the time. So Westboro was close by. We found an office building. I think at one point our, our, our office was actually out of Marlboro. And I guess to even start back, I initially started out of my house. You know, mm -hmm. I lived in Grafton. I had a home office. That's what I did because I couldn't afford the overhead of having, you know, a roof. But then we we moved, we moved to Westboro. That's been our home for, I think, since 2017 or so. Um, and then I met my husband who lived in Situate 
and we decided to get married. He has three little kids that he has 50% custody of. So we needed to be close enough to situate so that they could continue going to school there. I said, well, I need to be close enough to the highway since my my office is in Westboro, but I'll eventually open up uh, you know, a South Shore location. So we settled in Hanover. We moved in and literally a week later, the pandemic hit. And oh, wow. um, <laughs> so the South Shore office became Hanover just because that's where we were. We are actually in the process of buying an office building um, right in a, in a business park development. Um, and we're set to close, I believe next week or the week after. Oh, exciting. On that. So still in Hanover, but we're moving to a big old building. Yeah. And how, what have you found to be like with managing teams in different locations? I mean, I know everyone's pretty much remote now, but I think um, the, the team members I've been working with might've been from like Worcester or somewhere out in central mass. And so I think it's great to have like diverse people in the aspects of what regions of the state they're coming from. Yeah. So we, we do, we have attorneys kind of from Western mass. We have some in Boston, Plymouth. So we have them all spread across, which works well because we practice throughout most of Massachusetts. So Mm -hmm. when a case comes in, we try to assign it to the attorney. If it's just like a consultation drafting case, like a prenup or, you know, somebody's going through a mediation and just needs the separation agreement to be reviewed. Um, There's certain things, it doesn't matter where your attorney is located, but if it's a court related issue, we try to assign it to the attorneys that are based in that county. So we try to keep like our Plymouth County attorneys in Plymouth. We try to keep our Worcester attorneys in Worcester, um, Middlesex in Middlesex. There may be some crossing over, um, but that's what we try to do. So we take Mm. whoever the attorneys are and the case that comes in, the best attorney for that case, for that issue is usually the one that gets assigned to the case. Yeah, which makes sense. And then it makes it convenient for everyone too, so that clients don't have to drive far or attorneys don't have to drive far. It makes it really easy for everyone. Yep. And so as you really stepped into the CEO role of the law firm, I'd love to hear what your day-to-day looks like or what types of tasks or projects you typically focus on now that you've really built out your team extensively. Um, that's such an intricate question because I feel with... <laughs> Family law, when you're an attorney, and I still feel this way, even not necessarily being in the the legal fight every day, is all about putting out fires. Like there's a, every day yes. there's a new fire, <laughs> you know, there's something really bad happened that you might have the most perfect plan laid out for your day. And all of a sudden you're like, what the hell? Like, I didn't expect this. Seriously. And I still feel that's a lot of what I do. Like I plan out my day every single morning. And I think by the end of the day, there's 20,000 new things on my to-do list and only like five are crossed off. Um, But I think in the general scheme of things, you know, mine is again, more vision of where we're going. Um, Right now, the junior associate program has taken up quite a bit of time of planning that, you know, we have um, basically taking them through different types of cases from beginning to end and doing all activities. So it feels like they're doing cases, even though they're not real. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's been building that whole program has been a really big thing. Um, We're in quarter four now. So we're really starting our planning for next year. We have our executive meeting on Monday that has to do with that type of planning. Um, So it's, it's a lot more of like rebuilding our policies and procedures, making sure those are up to date, making sure that the strategies that we want to see within the different cases that our senior level attorneys are really emphasizing that to our regular associates. So it's, it's kind of like an oversight of everything and always just feels like there's fires that need to be put out. (laughs) I can relate, (laughs) but it's so important that you've been able to step into that role. It's so great that you've been able to step into that role because that's exactly like what you mentioned earlier, what will take you from that $4 million firm to the next 10 million is having someone who can really see the big picture, put those strategic plans in place and make it happen. 
Yeah. And sometimes that can be hard because I love litigating. I love going to court. I love the client interaction. You know, I'd drive to court and I'd have the Rocky theme in my head. I'd be like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so like, I loved that. And it, it was almost like a, a high you'd get, you know, walking in. And that was very, very difficult for me to give up. I still do it sometimes, um, mm. but it's usually when I'm filling in or, you know, we have some of my cases just went on forever. Um, and I had to just wait until they got through trial before I yeah. could step out. But yeah, it, it has, it's different, but, um, you know, it's, it's allowed me, I still have my hand in a lot of things and being able to strategize, but it's also fun setting up all the pieces to make sure that that happens, whether or not I'm in the picture, because we've also started, you know, succession planning. What happens yeah. if I get hit by a bus? You know, how does the firm still continue to move forward in the direction that, you know, the where we have it going right now, even if I'm not around? And so that's been another level that has thrown, like when I first started, I never thought I'd be planning something like that. But the goal is, again, you know, not only just for me now, but for our entire team, how do we keep that going? Yes, absolutely. All important questions to think about. And one question that I have for you is for any business woman who's listening to this podcast who may be going through divorce herself, what advice would you give? Specifically for a business woman? Yes. That's going through a divorce or thinking, if they're thinking about getting married, get Could a prenup. Either. Make sure you get a prenup. <laughs> that definitely, I can agree with that. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, if you're getting ready to move forward with a divorce, get get people into play to protect your business because there's going to be days that the emotions are just overwhelming and you're not going to be able to show up like you would otherwise. And nobody's Wonder Woman, like nobody's Superman. Nobody is that person that can be on all the time as much as you think you want to, as much as you want to have that persona, give yourself a break. You know, you don't have to do it all and be prepared to be upset. Be prepared to, you know, and, and allow yourself the support system and set it up where you have people who can step in for you. And I think that's a really important thing because you want your business to, you know, stay continuous throughout that and not suffer just because you're taking a hit. Um, yeah. So I think if it's somebody who hasn't already pre-planned, that would be my advice. But the biggest advice, especially for women who have businesses are moving towards marriage is get a prenup and protect it. Absolutely. And being an entrepreneur is very high stress. Being an attorney is very high stress, but you're also dealing with topics and subjects that are emotionally intensive too and very vulnerable and can be honestly draining just emotionally. And so going throughout your career, how have you been able to kind of decompress and separate kind of the thoughts that might be going through your head about cases or running a business and really making sure that you have that balance and that time for yourself? I can't say I'm the best at that. <laughs> you know, I, I consider myself a workaholic. I yeah. love what I do. I think about it all the time. You know, I might be out to dinner at my with my husband and all of a sudden, you know, something clicks in and I have to just get it out. And thankfully he's very supportive of me in that way where he's not like, oh, you're working again. So i fortunately I'm in a good relationship now where I do have that support. Um, but I think emotional wise, and, and especially when I was litigating all the time and very involved in the personal aspects, um, for the most part, I didn't find it that hard to, you know, it's stuff that you always think about, but I didn't find it that hard to disconnect and be able to go home mm -hmm. to my own family. But it, it was really when you truly believe in somebody and you want to see justice, you know, if, if that's the underdog and they're just getting completely destroyed by an abusive spouse you want that justice for them and you fight really hard for that. And there's times that the justice system is not just. And I think those were the hardest things to get through when I'd go home at the end of the day and I'd sit there and I'd be like, I'm just part of a broken system. What am I doing? Right. And that can often be very hard to recover from because then you feel like, what am I fighting for? What am I fighting for if I can't win because the, the system is stacked against, you know, somebody who really needs some help? Um, right. I found that to be very, very troubling. It's something that, you know, within my 10-year plan, I want to try to address and fix the system. 
we'll get there eventually. Um, but I think just on a day-to-day -day level, I take a lot of vacations. You know, you have to be able to step back for me, especially with working from home now. And just all I do is work. Vacation is the time that I step away. I try not to do anything. I try not to respond to emails um, and really just focus on where I am. And so for me, vacation, I have to literally like leave the state. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great idea. And something that I found works for me too, is just like having that physical separation where you physically cannot be where your work is and just being able to have that distance. And it's often when you have that distance in that time away that you get your best ideas because you're not actively thinking about work. And then all of a sudden you just have so much creative juices flowing and it can bring so much inspiration, which is great. Yeah, I remember my husband and I were flying down to Mexico for, I don't know, some family vacation. And I was reading a book and all of a sudden I just had this great business idea of a need that, that I've seen over and over again. And I was like, I don't think anybody's done this yet. And I started researching. I'm like, nobody, ha nobody's doing this. I'm like, oh my God, this is a great <laughs> business idea. And so I woke, he had fallen asleep on the plane and I woke him up. I'm like, I have a business idea. He's like, on the first day of vacation, you have business <laughs> idea. It's like, of course you do. <laughs> because it's so true. The second you can start to relax, everything opens up. Yeah, you get so much clarity, which is amazing. Yeah. I love it. One of my favorite questions that I love to ask our guests as we get closer to the end of this show is what their favorite local businesses are to support. So what would you say your favorite places are to shop at? Shop at locally. Um I mean, it's kind of like a chain, but I love TJ Maxx and Marshalls. And I know we have those in Norwell. Um, I think the Run Them Outlets. Me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but I think, you know, we, for local, we eat out quite a bit because we're both so busy. Yeah. So there's so many really great local restaurants on the South Shore that, you know, are awesome. Um, our house cleaning company, s and Solutions, they're absolutely amazing. I've done some things with them where I've actually given away house cleanings to, you know, to other people through my TikTok. Um, but yeah, those, those are probably the big things that come to mind locally. I own an, I own the edible arrangements in Hanover. So shout out to oh, that as do? well. No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're considered a small business. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. But, yeah. Totally. So we bought that in 2020 with the pandemic. And, um, and I was like, Oh, you know, if I'm going to sell it, I need to eat it all and love it. And then I like gained 30 pounds. <laughs> so. Yes. I feel like that would be totally dangerous for me. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there, there's so many. And when we took over, um, the edible arrangements, one of the things I really wanted to do with that was go around and interview other local businesses because it's easier to do that when you're not connected to a divorce and cut like when you're connected to a divorce and custody firm nobody really wants to talk to you but um <laughs> if you're coming from you know chocolate covered fruit everybody will talk to you oh yes absolutely <laughs> so, so i had started um it was a community spotlight and it was really really fun i just ran out of time to be able to do it all but we i interviewed um one woman who does home massages like she comes mm. and she sets up your home puts candles like does the whole massage thing I had somebody who travels to your home in a truck and does your hair um there's so many great businesses here and that was that whole point is I really wanted to spotlight those but you know there's only 24 hours in a day <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I know if only there was more time <laughs> Heather, this has been such an awesome episode and I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to learn more about you and all that you do. And now I'd love if you could share with our listeners where they can find you online in case they'd like to connect with you further. Sure. So our website itself is familylawma.com, like Massachusetts, but don't spell it out. And we're also all over social media. We have a Facebook, we have an Instagram, um, we have a TikTok, which is, you know, kind of big, but um, <laughs> it's O'Connor. O'Connor Family Law. I'm looking at my marketing person to make sure that it's the right. <laughs> uh, it's O'Connor Family Law. You just look it up. I'm pretty sure that's our, our screen name across every social media. Perfect. And I'll link to those in the show notes as well. So that way lis listeners can click through and connect with you from there. But thank you so much again for coming on the show today. Yeah, absolutely. Super fun. Thank you for having me.